everyone, George Christie here with Wine Industry Network. Welcome to the Wine Industry Sales Symposium Replay. Uh, we recently had our sales symposium conference in person. Uh, it was a great day, we covered some terrific topics. We had some great speakers, uh, but there were a few sessions that we wanted to uh, call out and share with a broader audience. Uh, so this particular session is uh, titled, Adapting Your PR Strategy for an Evolving Media Landscape. Now we've got some public relations professionals with a tremendous amount of experience on stage to share uh, their experiences and, and, and some advice on, on how to manage media in today's environment. So before we begin, I want to thank all of our sponsors. In particular, I want to call out Red Shirt for being our replay sponsor. We wouldn't be able to do it without their support. Uh, and of course, I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us today. So I hope you enjoy this session. You've got a lot to communicate. And if you can just get people to pay attention, you'll delight your customers and sell more wine. But people ignore emails and screen calls. Everyone does read their text messages, but alcohol regulations make compliance a bear. Use RedShirt to cut through the noise. Convert website traffic into reservations and sales with web-to-text chat. Reliably reach members about customizing club orders, declined cards, and delinquent pickups. Exceed your sales goals with customized promotions that make everyone feel like a VIP. Securely collect credit card info six times faster. Reduce returns and no-shows with completely automated shipment notifications and reservation reminders, while order attribution automatically connects text to sales so you know what's working. RedChirp is trusted by wineries of all sizes and integrates with your other tools. Get more leads, make more sales, and build stronger relationships with RedShirp. All right, hello. Um, so my name is Stacey Briscoe. I am the senior editor of Wine Enthusiast, um, where I also taste and review and rate the wines of California. Um, I also have my WSCT diploma and teach uh, WSCT classes through the Napa Valley Wine Academy. Um, and today I will be leading the discussion, which will primarily be between these lovely people up here, about the evolution of media. And um, really, I think that's a comment on the evolution of the wine consumer, um, which is a lot of what we talked about during Danny and Dale's presentation. So um, before we get started, I would like each of my panelists to introduce themselves. Um, Obviously, your name, what you do, and um, your kind of maybe if you have a specific niche in the PR or media relations uh, industry. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Rebecca Hopkins. I have been in the wine business too long to admit. Um, more than 20 years, we can say that. Uh, my background is in communications for the last 20 of that, and prior to that, in production and sales and distribution. Um, my Focus is really on luxury um, wine brands and primarily on the imported side of the business. Good morning. My name is Michelle Erland. Um, I'm a senior account supervisor with Colangelo and Partners Public Relations. Uh, I'm based in New York, but I'm fortunate that I get to work a lot out here on the West Coast with a lot of uh, great brands out here in California. Um, my background in PR, I do work a lot with fine wine brands, but I also have experience working in food and corporate communications. Hi there. Uh, I'm Michael Weinbickler from Balzac Communications and Marketing. Um, I happen to own that agency. And we offer bespoke services um, to our clients, and our clients um, are generally in the food and beverage space. And we like to work with clients whose values align with our own. And if you're interested in knowing what those values are, come see me out there in the hallway afterwards. Hello, um, yes. I'm Cotty Calhoun. I have Calhoun & Company Communications, a PR agency based in San Francisco that I've owned for 20 years. And we do specialize in wine and spirit brands and have um, a variety of clients, domestic and international, but our PR efforts are all in the United States. Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris O'Gorman. I grew up in Healdsburg, worked for small brands like Paul Hobbs and larger brands like the Gallo family over the past 20 plus years. And I currently have the great pleasure to work with Tom Klein and the good folks at Rodney Strong Vineyards. Awesome, all right, thank you. 
Um, so like I said, today we're going to talk about the evolution of wine media. Um, I've been reporting um, for and about wine for almost 10 years now, so I have been on the inside of that evolution. Um, but really what we want to talk about is how we as, or how you as a wine brand or wine um, brand owner can communicate to the media and thus to your potential consumers or existing consumers, um, especially, like we said, with the evolving consumer, the growing population of people that we, well, growing population of potential consumers, I should say. Um, so the first thing I wanna ask our panel, and I'll just start here with Beck because she's right next to me, um, is just if you can, in your opinion, um, how most significantly do you think we're seeing a shift in wine media um, and to kind of maybe feed off of that are traditional wine outlets, wine writers, wine critics um, becoming obsolete or is that still an important part if we are indeed moving on? Are we still trying to reach that kind of um, traditional market as well? It's probably changed more in the last five years than it's changed in the last 50 years. I think that's the first thing to say. Um, to answer the question simply, are they still relevant? Yes. What's becoming more important is the relationship side of how you work with press and understanding the media um, from an ethical journalistic practices point of view to a understanding uh, what they're writing about, what their beats are. Um, and I think, Stacey, you could probably speak to that being pitched a ton of irrelevant things that you don't even write about. But also, um, critics are global. And I think one thing that we may have sat in in the past as well is such and such rights for this domestic magazine and therefore um, their reach is within the US. Now, you take someone like James Suckling, that theory goes out the window. So I think you really have to, um, it's changed quickly. It will continue to accelerate in the way it changes. And also, so unfortunately for those of you who are responsible for press relations, uh, you're, you've got a lot of work cut out for you because it really is a matter of prioritising who your targets are, knowing what you're talking about before you even engage with them, and then doing the follow-up is, is how I set it up, Michelle. Thanks for nominating me. Um, and let me just say, it's a challenging question to have a journalist ask you if journalists are still relevant as a PR professional, but what I will I take it personally. <laughs> What I would say, yes, you are very relevant. Um, but one thing I do want to just highlight is that publications and media are facing the same challenges that you are all facing, right, with how do we all stay relevant in this changing world. So um, what we have found is we know that with all the technological developments that just keep happening. Um, things are shifting to digital spaces. Economically, it's getting harder for publications to stay in business if they don't adapt. Um, additionally, having influencer programs. Um, where I'll, I'll give you some great examples. We're recently working with um, Decanter, who has decided you know, what they want to have an influencer program in order to figure out how to target younger consumers and how to, in a way, do Wine 101 to bring in new readers. And, you know, Stacey, Wine Enthusiast does a phenomenal job of putting that digital um, publication forward to really try to reach new consumers. But in terms of critics, critics, I mean, scores are important when you think about what market you're targeting. So I work a lot with um, high net worth individual consumers, and for them, a lot of times, when they're making a purchase um, of these legacy brands, they're looking for investment value. And in that sense, these critics will always be important for their resale value. Would anyone else like to? All right, Mike, uh, you're up. I'm up. Say it nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how do I add something to what they've already said? Um, I think that in terms of what the relevance, yes, yes, critics and wine media are still relevant. Um, there are people who are still reading those publications and, and are influenced by them. Um, scores and reviews are especially important to the trade. So, you know, when you're trying to increase volume or increase velocity of your 
sales um, through your distributor channel, um, the scores can help in that regard. Um, that said, the newer generations, Gen X or Gen Z and, and millennials, aren't really paying as much attention to that as previous generations have. And um, there's also you know, uh, other segments of the market that we've completely ignored, and they're not really reading those as, as well. So bringing in other ways of communicating to those audiences is important. So influencers is a good, good one, um, but also just direct communication with them. And the thing that you need to really keep in mind is, is that there are a lot of wineries out there, 11,000 according to the last um, presentation. So how are you going to stand out from that? And you really need to be able to tell your core story in a way that's going to not only interest the journalist, but also your end user cons consumer. So as Beck said, it's evolved so much in the last five years. And for us now, and I think for all of us, content creators, influencers, are media. Whether we like to think of them that way or not, whether that was even their intention. Um, so traditional media, online bloggers, uh, and content creators, to us, are all vehicles and ways to reach an audience. And we want to touch all those audiences, and those span multi-generational opportunities. Uh, so at this point, we weave it all together. And um, the social media influencers and content creators, some of them are turning into writers and actually finding themselves in print publications also. So it's crossing over in many different ways. And, and we now embrace all of that and, and reach all of them, and it is relationship building. Uh, we also really focus on earned media as much as possible and not on paid media. And uh, there's still a lot of earned media to be had, but that is for sure relationship uh, development to, to make that happen. The relationship thing really hasn't changed in 100 years in PR. Storytelling, everybody up here is a storyteller. Getting the story right, building relationships across the wine business with media, as Cotty said, Today's blogger or influencer could be tomorrow's five-star wine writer. You just never know. And so create all these relationships. Get your story correct and get it out there. I like that. Um, okay, so kind of listening to you guys talk, it, it seems like there's like a lot of different outlets there. So a lot of um, potential when it comes to creating those relationships, whether it's traditional media, whether it's influencers, bloggers, podcasters, whatever it is. Um, and that's a lot of stuff. So I'm just putting myself in, you know, I'm a winery, I'm a brand owner. Um, do I pick one? Do I try to reach all of these people all at once? Like what, what do we do? <laughs> What's the strategy? And I'll let whoever is motivated go first here. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think, you know, it really depends. First, the first thing you need to do is look at who, what the audiences that you want to target, right? So, um, figure out, like, who your, um, ideal client profile is, right? And then once you have an idea of, okay, this is the ideal buyer for my, for this wine or this wine or this wine, then go out and figure out, okay, who is writing about similar wines and um, also like who is reading their material and so focus on those outlets that are going to target the audience that you want to hit. If you spray and pray, you know, just kind of, you know, toss a bunch of stuff out there and hope that something sticks, you're going to end up wasting a lot of money and a lot of time. So focus on who your audience is, and which outlets are going to hit that audience. And I just want to say that if you're not sure and you don't have in-house PR, there's some esteemed folks on my panel here and folks I see out in the audience, is bring in all these agencies and find the great fit and let them lead you down the path until you know what you're doing, until you know what your focus is. And also, it's dependent on the tier of your wine. If you're a lifestyle brand, if you're a luxury brand, you're going to want to focus on different types of the media and have different PR folks helping you do that. So we represent probably about 15 different 
uh, wine brands and clients right now, and they're remarkably different. I mean, what they want, and, um, and sometimes there's some counsel about what they want and what they can actually achieve, and may not align, but, uh, but depending on the prices of the wine, uh, depending on the distribution, is it DTC only, are you nationally distributed? I mean, there's so many different factors that go into considering what media are appropriate for your, uh, for your product. Uh, and um, so we, that's what, we can help narrow down this sea of uh, people that we want to reach based on all these different factors. And it's really, it's a strategy discussion. And I would just add to the points um, that my colleagues on the stage mentioned, but um, a lot of times we have clients that want to go for that top publication. I'm sure all of us are thinking of that magazine, but you know, we don't need to put all our eggs into one basket. There's a lot of opportunities. Our consumers are not all reading that publication. There's podcasts that are going on, not only in the wine industry, but in other industries where they're bringing wine elements into it, and you can reach consumers in that way as well. Yeah, just adding to that, Michelle's point, um, looking outside the industry is actually a really interesting way for your brand to gain attention, because to the, to the point, it's a very saturated market. Um, you can't do it all. There will be some relationships that will be easy to maintain, probably because you've had them for a while, but other relationships will take a while to develop. So the biggest cost in what we do is time, and it's investing that time in the right way to make sure that um, you understand, number one, where your consumers are and what they're reading, what they're doing, how they're consuming media. Is it podcast? Is it video? Is it print? God forbid, is it online? Um, but also then, what are they doing when they're in that space? What's their attention span? It's really short. And so, again, helping your leadership understand, or if you are leadership, learning that this comes down to attention, it comes down to your consumer, and, and go where they are um, would be a way to go forward. So I, I really like the comment, um, you know, a, about bringing in uh, or getting your your brand out there via other um, whether it's consumer packaging or you know other other outlets that maybe aren't necessarily wine centric or wine focused um, because everybody mentioned across the board in that first question about storytelling um, and it it's definitely an important part to getting your story out there to you know first getting the attention of your chosen media source, um, but I feel like storytelling, and we talked a little bit about this in our pre-call, pre storytelling is the new um, wine label, if you will. There's so many wine labels when you look at you know, your wine.coms, your drizzlies, what have you, when you go to your Safeways, your Total Wines, um, and nowadays you know, your, your, your um, Instagram and your TikTok is just filled with wine stories. So. I guess my, my follow-up question is how, how do you use that idea of storytelling to now stand out on the modern wine shelf, if you will, on the, on the media wine shelf? Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm glad you bring that up because um, packaging is one of those things that most people don't really consider it to be communications or public relations, but the fact is that that's the first impression that most people get when they're picking up a bottle of wine. So um, I was actually at um, the Texom Wine Awards uh, last week, and I was actually in charge of assigning um, writing assignments to the sommiers that were there for reviews of the gold medal and the platinum metal winning wines. And the different kinds of, of package, um, and when I say package, like label, let's say label, that came through was, was very diverse. But, then the, but there, was, there were definitely some that came through that uh, I took note of. And I actually took photos of them, so if you want to come by and, and take a look at the photos. Um, where they definitely stood out from the rest. Um, and, and when it comes to, again, kind of engaging those new consumers, I don't want to steal the thunder of the next session, but still, um, 
that's where things kind of have to start. You have to have, a, you have, to have, a, have an engaging, the engaging story starts at the label, right? One of the ways that you can actually do that and has been implemented by a few is with augmented reality, right? Um, 19 Crimes, um, Rabble, you know, they have augmented reality labels and they're really cool. Um, and they tell you a story about, you know, what, what's in, in the bottle and you don't have to read a long story, you don't have to get a lecture on, you know, what's, you know, what the, what the wine is made of, et cetera. The hot it's days just, and the cool nights. Yeah. <laughs> so, so seriously, it's like, you know, think about like, you know, what is going to catch attention from your consumer. Well, I don't want to say terroir is dead, but terroir is one of these many long used ways of describing wine that, that I think the younger generation is not as interested in. So there's other things. I mean, Rabble's an interesting um, case where, yes, the AI, the label. Um, there's also cause marketing behind it. So they represent 1% for the planet. They do one tree planted during the month of um, Earth Month in April. Uh, and those things are all on the QR code on the back label as well. So you can check out and learn more about what your purchase actually delivers to the planet. And um, these things speak a lot to certainly the younger generation and bring in other elements about a product that isn't just, uh, I mean, the, obviously sustainability is really key. Um, and so in that way, terroir really does matter. So I'm, but as far as how you're reaching this audience and the, and the language you're speaking, and there's been many a seminar recently about the language of wine and how are we speaking about wine and the words we're using. Uh, and I think that that's also changing. Agree 100%. Um, and I also, to go off of what Caddy said, I think too, the labels and the what the label is saying to your consumer audience is another way to bridge the wine community into other communities. So whether it's art and really, I'm all about community. This, I think wine should be fun. It should be on the table. Everyone should feel good with wine as the center of attention. So I think whether it's music or art, labels are a way to bridge um, those communities together. Standing out uh, amongst the sea of wine is a challenge that we all face, and it's a big challenge. Um, and there's certain things we can control, like wine quality, whether we want to base our wines on a sense of terroir, a sense of place. Um, but also, back to the story really quickly, it's not just the owner's origin story or that we're sustainable, but it's getting out to the vineyards and talking to the vineyard workers, getting into the cellar. Uh, we have a guy, Rodney Strong, who celebrated his 50th anniversary, Roland. That's a cool story, right? There's stories out there. You have to go find them, and that's what can differentiate you. And I would say, picking up on that, is knowing what to do with that story once you've got it. You know, you've got Roland's story, then where do I put it? Is it on my packaging? You know, Signature Winery from Yolumba, they honor one of their team members every year with the wine, their signatures on the bottle. Um, to your point, so it's that first point of contact. I worked with an Italian client, very high-end Brunello producer, who told their story through um, NFT, through um, QR code technology on the neck of the um, bottle. But what that did is that then took you to an audio experience. So no matter where you were in the world, you could lie back, click on that, and hear a story from the winemaker. And you could be sitting a bazillion miles away, but it was a story on that vintage, of those conditions, and it, it helped immerse you uh, in an audio format, which we're using every day, but it was using the packaging to work harder in order to, to connect those dots. So... One of the things, and you guys touched on this a little bit, and I kind of want to expand on it, um, is about the storytelling in terms of connecting with the consumer. So yeah, if it's, you know, whether your, your winery story is going to be focused on terroir, or if it's going to be your, your workers or your family story, whatever it is. Um, but one of the things, and again, this is something that we, we talked about earlier, is about your consumer story. So once you've, you've tagged in on who your key market is, whether that's a specific demographic or a, you know, a specific region, whatever it is, um, but knowing how they communicate and what um, is important to them. And kind of going to what Danny was talking about, um, about whether it's environmental, social, governance, wellness, um, and, and those kinds of things and, and tagging that into your story, 
Um, and Michelle had, some, had said something that I, like, I actually kind of want to quote you. You said, storytelling is no longer about necessarily the story of the brand um, and how it's more about how the brand is going to fit into my life, me being the consumer and, what, and, and, the, and the community around me. So how, how is that brand going to come into my community? Um, so since I just quoted you, Michelle, <laughs> do you want to speak on that a little bit? Sure. Um, so first of all, this is not a one-size-fits-all model, um, but I can speak as a millennial. Um, ooh, I, ooh. <laughs> I, I would say, you know, we grew up without, excuse me, all of this, and then this arrived when we were kids, and um, then 9-11 happened, there was heaviness in our school years, and then we graduated, went to go, to get, go get a job, and they were like, you're in a recession, so we're gonna give you this job, but we're gonna pay you, you know, we'll start paying you next week, you gotta do the intern thing for free for a month, and so we have to get two other jobs to survive, and then, you know, everyone's saying that we're living in our parents' basements because we're lazy, but we're out there just trying to figure out how to make money. Um, so, Ultimately, as a millennial, it's wonderful to you know, hear these aspirational stories, but at the same time, it's tone deaf into the reality of, you know, it's hard out there for a lot of people. So I think that the story is how can we bring our brand, our story into the lives of these people and bring them in, make it accessible, make it fun. Um, don't, you know, wine is a luxury product. Um, there is a little bit of, you know, rarity, exclusivity, but we don't want people to feel like they don't belong, right? It's not for them. They're not for this industry. So just keeping that all in mind, how do we bring our product into the community and, and make it like they're a part of it? I like to say, perfectly said, by the way, <laughs> I, I like to say that the wine business needs to be more inclusive than exclusive, right? For years, we've basically built this mystique around wine that it has to be something special. But the fact is, is that that's basically alienated a whole generation or two of potential wine consumers. Um, you know, one of the ways for you to connect with those communities, I mean, like, look around. Look around the room right now and look and see who's in here, right? There's not a whole lot of diversity in here, right? So um, making sure that you consider like hiring people who actually are part of those generations or parts of those underserved communities, making sh or hiring an agency who has that, right? You need to be able to have the perspective of other people, right? And because you can't assume like I'm a Gen Xer, and I totally get what you're saying because I have had to switch the way that I look at millennials and Gen Z as a way like, they have a lot to offer, right? They have actually great insights and fresh insights that some of us older people don't have. So bringing that into your organization, whether through you know, hiring or, um, or consultation or whatever, will help you to bridge the gap from where you are here to where you need to go as a business to help scale and grow your business. I would just add that it's never a bad thing to learn about your customer. Send them a query, find out what they like. Do they like fast cars? Do they like music festivals? Do they like wine experiences? That's a good thing. And then growing that is a slightly different question. That's when you need to be a little more creative, um, bring in some help perhaps, get at millennials, get at Gen Z. We've been talking about getting at millennials, by the way, for about 15 years, like everyone in this panel. We're here. <laughs> Not in our parents' basements. <laughs> yeah, I would also add, I think that um, to the point around the demographic shift and there's also real importance on observing what's going on at a macro level in our industry. So we're looking at Amanda McCrossan, who's in the next session. I don't know if you're here, but your wine in pouch session on TikTok yesterday was awesome. Um, this is how our community is talking about wine, and it's exciting, and it's new, and it's, it's taking our mindset that we might have, which might be traditional around a certain bottle format or a certain style of wine, and thinking about package, 
thinking about format, thinking about size, thinking about alcohol, um, and playing back into a lot of those macro trends that Danny's talking about. Because if we don't respond to those trends, other categories will. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we don't like to talk about a great deal. But when we talk to the media, that's what the media are reading. That's what their editors are assigning. They're being assigned stories that are on a much bigger level than maybe what your brand story might be. So I think it's, again, it's, it's reading everything you have, but it's also just being aware of the larger cultural conversation and who are those media that are really leading that. Read their stuff inquire, get curious, and, and really get yourself in that conversation. You might, you might not have the production ability to go and make, I don't know, a 375 mil, 5% Rodney Strong Cabernet. <laughs> or you might. But I think it's, it's something that says, who is your consumer, what are you speaking to, and, and adapting to them beyond just an age or, you know, an ethnicity. So my next question is, once you kind of have that idea of that target audience and you have that idea of, okay, here's, here's my, my story that I, I want to tell, you know, in media, yes, we deal a lot with trends and there's always going to be the like, here's the cool, cute, trendy thing. Um, I hate that word because to me trends means it's going to come and go and then like a year from now we're going to be like, oh, yeah, remember that thing that happened? So, or try. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but, but for, for, you know, a business sustainability standpoint, you don't want to be trendy. You want to be long lasting. You want to find some kind of brand loyalty. So is there a way that you know you can advise or prescribe or suggest that folks can in an authentic way tell these stories you know you know taking that terroir example i made that snide comment about the hot days and cool nights because if i get another press release telling me that your wines are so balanced because of the high acidity because you have the hot days and the cool nights and that's a unique feature to your terroir I guarantee you, I will double delete that email. <laughs> okay, and if, and if you kindly bump it to the top of my inbox, I will kindly block you. So, like, because I've heard that story a thousand times, and it's true. Like, anywhere that makes really quality wine has some kind of diurnal shift. So, stick a pin in that. Um, so that's just my kind of snotty way of saying how how do we how do we get something to sound authentic when everybody's trying to be like, oh, I'm a family winery, or oh, like you know, I come from nothing and now I built something. Like, how do we make that resonate with folks in an authentic way that we're gonna be like, oh yeah, like there's a story that I wanna tell or there's a brand that I wanna connect with. So I have, um, working with a client that has for 10 or 15 years had an organic garden at the winery. It's four acres of organic garden. And uh, they do have a culinary program so they're able to use the produce uh, in the culinary program at the winery and tie it back to the wine with wine and food pairings. They also donate a lot of it to, um, to food, shelters, and they serve a restaurant in the region as well. But we're able to take this organic garden story. They have, they have two full-time gardeners. Um, and we, we do a lot with that story because it's super authentic uh, and it's, it weaves back into the story of food and wine, um, speaks to the sustainability, all of these different pillars. So I think it is finding the authentic piece of the story that resonates with whatever brand we're, we're working with. Um, so there can be many different ways it happens. Um, it's one example. So yeah, agreed that doing some, some other things um, can, can act as um, an interesting angle. Um, one thing I would add is, again, like, go to, go to where they are. So think about what the experience is for the customer and for the writer, right? And think about, okay, what kind of experience do we want them to have with us, right? What kind of relationship do we want to have? It's admittedly a one-sided relationship because you don't often get the feedback back, but like what kind of, of feeling do you want 
to communicate to the writer, to the end, user, end, end customer when they are experiencing your wine, right? Think of it in terms of that way, and honestly, the story starts to write itself. And one thing just to add to that point is, you know, especially out here in, in California, you all have the privilege of having consumers on site and being able to talk to consumers. And I think sometimes we need to listen more <laughs> and like hear the feedback to really understand the authenticity of our story. And I know sustainability is a big word that we're all using, but there's different levels of sustainability. I think having the real conversation with people is better than saying, I mean, Stacy, you can add, but instead of just saying, yeah, we're doing all these things, more it's about, are we? Are we having this conversation? Just be honest with where you are as a brand and, and have the you know, open dialogue with your consumers that are already your customers. Say, sorry. On that, I would say I'm going to take a quote from one of the great wine writers of our time, John Breacher, the other half of Dottie and John. Be honest and tell the truth. You have family stories. Families aren't perfect. Yeah. If you have one, show me because I'd like to learn. Um, you know, wine is something that f food, and w food and experience are easier visual stories to tell than wine in a lot of ways, right? So think about, again, how are you talking about your brands to people? And, and also telling the truth to the press. And that's going to really select who you talk to and when on what, but that's your job. Your job is to decide what is newsworthy and what is of interest to the journalists because journalists are paid to serve their readers. They're not paid to serve their brands. And as influencers come in, their credibility relies on them telling the truth as well. Um, I'm not sure I agree that all brands do want to live forever because I think that there, we have seen brands in all categories come and go quite quickly. So maybe that's their strategy. Um, but I, I see your point about that being in wine. But really it's about being honest, telling the truth, and finding what's the nut of your story, because humans want to hear human stories. That's what we connect to. So. And I agree with that last point. There's a lot of potential wine consumers out there. We're blessed with great terroir here in Sonoma County. But if you're making wine in a can that you can crush at pool parties all summer, that's cool. It may not be here for five, year, five years from now, and that's totally fine. I may not send that wine to the wine enthusiast, but I may send it to some health magazines or Maxim or who knows. Send it lifestyle. to my house. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, but that's okay, right? That's some wildering. Um, so actually, there's a few good questions that uh, came up with the Q&A that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bounce to now. Um, and uh, one, one that was interesting here for me, it says, what is the best in-house PR strategy? So maybe this is a question for you, Chris, for a brand that may have a reputation that isn't correct or positive. That's a good question. <laughs> um, depending on your skill set uh, is the internal communications function. You may want to bring in outside help if there's a crisis issue to be dealt with. Highly recommend doing that, by the way. Um, and getting the story right and kind of riding the ship is a big deal. Uh, sometimes you can't turn that around in a day or two or five years. But um, starting to turn the ship around is an important thing. Uh, there's brands here in Sonoma County that have issues around that and various things I don't want to get into. But uh, some people in the audience uh, may know what I'm talking about. Um, and it, it can just take time and highly recommend bringing in outside help with that. I can say from a personal experience, and again, I won't name names or anything, but I, I did have one instance where um, something happened at a winery and incorrect press went out right away. And I luckily had a good relationship with um, one of the kind of higher ups. Um, and so she called me and she was like, can you run something that corrects this? Um, and so we were able to do that for her. This was at a previous um, position of mine. Um, reporting for another outlet, but um, so uh, just kind of highlighting the point of having those personal connections with media can also help you in, in a pinch if you absolutely need to. Um, not all outlets are able to do that. I can't speak on behalf of everyone, but where I was at that time and because I knew that person and because our company had a relationship with that winery, we were able to help her out. So. 
Um, and I'll just add, I, I do have experience in crisis communications, and one thing I always reiterate is there's a difference between managing a crisis and communicating a crisis. So if you are not, depending on the severity, but if there is a major problem and you go to your legal team and figure out how to turn that around, um, and then on the communication aspect, it's everything that we've already spoken about. It's being authentic. You have to be honest. Um, that's really the only way to start turning uh, a story around. Um, and here I would say, don't forget tasting room employees and employees are your front line. And so really your messaging first should be to them because they're the ones that are gonna be out there really assisting you. The media, you need the media, but in this scenario, don't forget your employees with the messaging. That's great. That's really yeah, good. and also on that, giving them, to your point, that checklist of what happens. Because I think in crisis, as, as we know, and having had experience in that world as well, people freeze because they're not prepared. And it's not that they're ill-intended, but they're just not prepared. I would also say, understand what the problem is and what your ownership is in that problem. Mm -hmm. So is there is it a reputation, where's that coming from? And, and really get honest internally with your team at looking at the issues and then really saying, is this a legal issue? Is this a marketing issue? Is this a wine production issue? So that you could be a personnel you... issue or a leadership issue. Exactly, yeah. So there's a lot more to consider than just, my wines aren't being well thought of, let's get a publicist <laughs> in to go and fix it. Right. It's just not a fun experience for anyone, again, if we're not all being honest with what the real problem is. Yeah, so I mean, you know, there's crisis communications, but there's also reputation management, mm -hmm. right? And that's, what, and that's what Becca's talking about, is that you need to be able to manage your reputation out there in the, in the internets, um, but in order to do that, you need to make sure that you've actually made the changes to, uh, to fix the problem that you had to begin with. And I think reputation management is kind of what we do every day on a positive side, not just because there's a crisis, but because that's how we want to elevate, elevate the brands and elevate our clients. So whether it's the, the positive, amazing experience your consumers have in your tasting room, whether it's you know, the product going out in your bottle, whether it's the stories being told. So um, reputation management, we're all, you want your reputation to be, to be awesome and there's so many ways to achieve that. Uh, Can I just add one more thing? Is the recent fires showed all of us how important it is to have a crisis PR plan in place before these things happen? So I. So actually, quick poll: How many people in the audience have a crisis communications plan? Okay. Oh snap! Come to any of these people up here. We'll help you. You guys. Okay. Um, I really like this next question, and I'm curious to hear the answer. Is it possible? that media professionals are actually a barrier to wine brands telling their story? No, not a few. <laughs> Thanks, Cotty. No, no, but I want to say no because then there's so many media out there. I mean, back to the beginning of our conversation, there's so many different ways to share your message and, and so many different avenues to go down. Um, so not every outlet is the right outlet, not every editor, you're right, that's maybe also part of the relationship. The more you know about these writers, the more you can target who's going to be sensitive or um, appealing to, to your story. So uh, we, we do need media, so I, I, I think media are fantastic, but we don't target all of them for every situation. I'm going to say no. Um, because, Thanks, guys. Sorry. I mean, I, 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 the reason is, I think now we have so many direct channels to consumers that, and we're not living in the era of Robert Parker. We're living in part of that, but we're not in this one opinion, one point, one voice. Um, and I think that has been a dramatic shift in a good way for us to be able to reach those people. I think if the question was posed, are they a barrier for specific categories mm -hmm. where you may have a very influential voice that does not agree with your style or your personnel or your brand? That's, a, that's obviously a challenge. Um, but to Carly's point, there are other ways that you can go about that and other press that you can talk to um, that can help you to, to navigate that roadblock. I'm going to say yes. Oh, Mike, I knew you'd get there. If you don't have a good story. 
right? Because if you're, if you're boring and you're telling the same story that, that hundreds of other wineries are telling, yeah, that writer is not going to want to write about it because they've already written about it a million times. So be unique, be creative, come up with something that's going to catch their attention. Then they don't become a barrier. And don't talk about warm days and cool nights. <laughs> I think, I think Mike just hit the nail on the head. If, you, if there's one takeaway from this panel discussion, I hope that it's do not be boring. Um, I have another question here, um, and I'm curious how you guys will answer this one. Um, gender roles in your brand story, for example, female CEO or winemaker, does this still make you stand out? Well, you could ask the same about diversity um, uh, in your in your winery or in the C-suite, so uh, or in the winemaking team, and I think we were talking about. Chris mentioned you have an employee that's been there for 50 years. Um, there, there's so many wonderful people working in the vineyards, working in your cellar, um, working in your tasting rooms, and I think you you need to look through your roster and. Surely there are some people that should be highlighted and, and brought forward, and they may be shy, and they may not want this publicity, but there's media training. Um, and, and I think that it does help to, to highlight whether they're female or male in different diverse places. So all those levers matter. Again, I think it depends on who you're talking to, right? Who the audience is. Certain things are going to be important to certain audiences, and certain things are not going to be. So really, again, it depends on you know, who you're trying to talk to. The wine business is falling way short in DEI. And I'm glad that there is now a new lens into this and shining a light, but we have a long, long way to go. Agreed. A long way to go. Agreed. Agreed. All right, I think I'm going to just do one more question. Do I have time for one more question? Well, okay, one more. Thanks, George. Um, okay. Uh, so this one was... Uh, technically geared towards me, but I'm going to also open it up to the panel. It says, um, Stacy, you're active in social media industry groups. Uh, do you develop story ideas based on topics that come up in group chats and an effective way to pitch ideas? So yes, um, this is true. I do, you know, obviously I'm on LinkedIn. Um, also, Facebook has a lot of wine industry groups that I kind of follow and subscribe to. And yeah, every once in a while I do pick up maybe not a story, but a nugget that I find interesting and then we'll follow that lead. So I guess my, my advice coming from my side um, would just be, you know, yeah, be active in those spaces. I wouldn't hardcore pitch ideas in those spaces. Um, I kind of don't like it when people slip into my DMs. Um, if you, if you want to communicate with me, like my email's on the Wine Enthusiast website. I'm really easy to reach. Um, but yeah, if you just want to, you know, engage in social media in that way, there's lots of writers that are in those groups that will you know, pick up on those kind of nuggets. Um, and so I kind of wanted to open it up to you guys and say, is that something that you either encourage your clients to do or as PR folks also um, engage in that kind of social uh, engagement? Um, I would say that there are some writers that are opposite of you and they will say, looking to speak with somebody, please DM me on this. So we do find a lot of leads in these groups and I think for brands that maybe are lesser known, have smaller budgets, it's a great opportunity to network with writers and find opportunities to be a spokesperson in a story. I'm on Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn every day just reading. I'm, I'm scrolling through and I'm finding so much information about my wine writers. So I'm, you know, I'm, I follow them, they follow me, and so we're friends, if you will, on social media and I learn all sorts of things that are happening with the writers, not only where they are but where they're going and they often do ask for leads or questions. So um, it's just more of the relationship component of, of learning about them where they are. Yeah, and don't underestimate the power of flattery. <laughs> Seriously, like, you know, the thing is, is that being, being a journalist is sometimes a thankless job because they don't really, most of the, most of the feedback they get is usually negative because that's the only ones that are, will go through the process of, of posting something like a negative comment. Um, but, you know, if you want to build a relationship, 
you know, if they've written a great article, let them know. Great article. Thanks for, thanks for doing that. Every media person has a social presence. And at the very beginning of the session, Beck mentioned it's about relationships. So how better to get to know people than to follow them socially, comment, send them some notes, and create a dialogue. Say thank you. And also, if you see a writer working on a beat that you have no clients to do with, you're nothing to do with it, just give them that lead. You know, save them the time. Journos are on a 24-7 news cycle. We all are. So, you know, if there's a story on sustainability, you've seen something cool, you found a nugget, if you have a good relationship with a writer, give it to them. Every writer wants that first opportunity to tell that story. For sure. And I, I will say, again, coming from my point of view, I actually am friends, I think, with all of you on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Um, and it, it, there is something to be said for, you know, yeah, commenting on an article I wrote or, you know, saying congrats on an achievement or whatever. Um, because then when I get their emails in my inbox, I'm like, oh, it's Beck, oh, it's Mike, like, okay, what is it that they, they have to say, you know? Um, so, yes, awesome. <laughs> thank you, guys. Um, and thank you guys for joining us. I'm definitely way over time, so um, thanks for hanging out with me. And please hang out for the next session, which is about catering to millennials and beyond. <laughs>